This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. If you want to become a patron, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And uh, my guest tonight is Eric Wargo. Hello, Eric. Hello, Soraya. How are you? And uh, you're someone I've wanted to have on the show for a while, uh, for a few years, actually. Um, and then you've released this book, Time Loops, Precognition, Recausation, and the Unconscious. And this is a fantastic book. Uh, it has seriously altered the way I've looked at some experiences in my life and potentially restructured how I look at reality. I'm glad to hear that. So I'm, I'm very, very impressed with this. It's, it's not often I can say that about a book. I'm, that's a great compliment. Thank you. Now you're, uh, you're an anth- you have a PhD in anthropology, right? And you, you write about, uh, you, you mostly write in your blog, right? The night shirt. Yeah. I've been writing a, a, a blog, a paranormal blog for about a, well, over a decade now, I guess about 12 years. Um, it was really only the last 10 years I've written about paranormal topics. I sort of started with UFOs back in around 2009 after I saw a couple of UFOs. And, uh, <clears throat> but it kind of morphed into really being more about parapsychology. Well, those things kind of go hand in hand anyway. Well, they do, yeah, which is uh, was kind of a surprise for me. I mean, I really was a, a newbie to the whole area uh, and delving into UFO you know, research and, you know, you quickly encounter Jacques Vallée's work mm-hmm. and he's linking it all to psychic phenomena. I was like, wow, that, this is pretty interesting. I'd never made, i never would have made that connection. But, uh, so that's really what kind of sucked me into, um, studying ESP now, uh, and ESP research. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think most of this stuff is connected in one form or another. It's just a matter of figuring out what that, what that is. Yeah. Right. And, you know, like poltergeist phenomena goes through everything. You know, it's like you see a UFO, then you f- it follows with poltergeist phenomena. People right. hunting Bigfoot have what seem to be poltergeist phenomena in the woods. You know, it's right. mm-hmm. and that, of course, if it links to us, if it's us creating the poltergeist phenomena, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. what, what, what does that all mean? Right, <clears throat> right, exactly. So you you start this book talking about how science addresses the paranormal. Do you want to get into that a little bit? Well. Uh, that's kind of a loaded question. I mean, most science mostly doesn't address the paranormal, uh, as we both know. Um, however, there, and there are a lot of interesting reasons why, uh, but, you know, on the, on the fringe, or not fringes, on the margins or in the sort of, in the cracks that nobody notices of, of science, uh, there are, have, and for a long time have been very smart people uh, who know that there's something to the paranormal uh, and and study it seriously, I mean, without merely an intent to debunk. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, of course, the field of parapsychology is, is well known. It's not, you know, taken very seriously within the mainstream, um, especially by psychology. I mean, it's kind of, you know, ironic that, that, you know, most parapsychology, well, no, I, I won't say most, I don't know how it breaks down percentage wise, but, you know, the, a lot of, uh, pioneering parapsychologists have not been psychologists, you know, they've been physicists or engineers or, mm. you know, the Rhines, you know, back in the thirties were botanists by training, you know, they, and then, you know, they, they, uh, formed their, their research center, you know, within the, uh, you know, umbrella of the psychology department at, uh, uh, Duke, but, um, you know, it's it's psychology and psychology has had a very uneasy relationship with parapsychology, uh, from the start. And, uh, you know, if, if anyone knows anything about parapsychology, it's usually from, you know, the chapter on pseudoscience in their psych, psych 101 textbook, <laughs> you know, uh, most psychologists are sort of 
uh, just sort of trained and one could say indoctrinated in the idea that, that, that parapsychology is just pseudoscience and wishful thinking. And, and it's an example of, you know, and they'll run a list of biases, you know, and, and cognitive, you know, fallacies of reasoning and so forth. <laughs> and, uh, and they'll rehearse the claim that there's no actual scientific evidence, which yes. is completely false. I mean, right. there's, there's abundant, abundant scientific evidence and it's very, very strong, uh, for some, for some phenomena, uh, and uh, particularly precognition, there's 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 very very robust evidence for various forms of precognition, yeah. uh, and this has been assessed and reassessed by statisticians and so on, and you know meta analyses have found you know astronomical significance uh, for uh, for the effect, and one of the and one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that keeps the field marginal is that it's lacked a theory, you know, it's lacked uh, uh, a theory of how it could be possible and how it yeah. could work. And that's one of the things that's kept it marginal all these years, because, you know, it's not, it's really not enough to just show evidence of some effect. You need to have some kind of explanation for how it could work. And that's what's really been been missing. And, uh, and not for lack of trying, I mean, for, for many years, parapsychologists in the United States and in, and in the Soviet Union, you know, just desperately searched for some sort of electromagnetic, you know, uh, waves that, that might account for it. You know, so they did a lot of experiments putting psychics in Faraday cages, which block, uh, block most forms of electromagnetic radiation. And they discovered that it didn't affect psi functioning at all. Uh, they would, you know, tr you try and use it to communicate with submarines because seawater blocks uh, uh, most electromagnetic radiation, and that didn't affect things. Yeah, you know, so they would do all sorts of things to try and sort of figure out if there was some uh, electromagnetic basis to uh, to these effects, and they couldn't find anything. Uh, and then in the seventies, it. Uh, sort of a new metaphor from quantum physics became popular. That's the metaphor of entanglement and non-locality. So you'll, and that's still sort of the prevailing, uh, it's not an ex explanation because it really can't explain anything, but at least works as a metaphor for how things, you know, for how this might work. Um, and, you know, these days, you know, the, the term consciousness is, of course, very, uh, it's kind of the, the, everybody's favorite keyword. Hmm. Um, and, and some parapsychologists will sort of just say, well, you know, consciousness is fundamental. It's sort of even more basic than physics. And, and, uh, you know, so they'll sort of, sort of try to get out of the problem by saying, well, it's all consciousness and, and you can't, you know, there's nothing more fundamental than consciousness. And, and so, <laughs> you know, there's, you, you don't need to look for, for some sort of material, uh, uh, cause in the world. I don't know. I, I'm not very satisfied with those kinds of explanations, but, it, but the point is it's suppress psychology. One of the reasons it's so marginal and that people don't pay attention to it is because it hasn't had a good theory, uh, a good sort of nuts and bolts theory of how this could work. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> I, I would think also it's a matter of, of how much, uh, nonsense is, is brought up around it as well. It's easy for a skeptic to point to, sure. you know, TV psychics and be like, oh, yes. so this, this is legitimate, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and no, kind of absolutely. throw it all in the same bag. Absolutely. And this is the problem across the paranormal, not just with, you know, ESP and stuff, but you know, it's like, so, you know, if I'm, you know, talking to someone about, you know, ESP or whatever, you know, I have in my head, you know, <laughs> very legi <laughs> legitimate, bona fide, you know, you know, so, you know, a remote viewer, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a legitimate, you know, psychic spying program or, uh, or someone who's having a legitimate, you know, psychic dream that they can't explain. Whereas the person I'm talking to might in their head, you know, have, you know, like a TV psychic, like, uh, uh, yeah, I can't, think of her name but yeah yeah the, 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 
yeah, people people <laughs> have different things in their head when they're when you hear these terms. So, uh, so that yeah, that's definitely a problem. Um, yeah, I'm should... not talking about like fortune. T- <laughs> yeah, we're not talking about like fortune tellers. You're fortune teller on the street. Not that those people can't necessarily be psychic, but that's uh, yeah, it's a it's there's a difference. Yeah, yeah, and uh, t- talk a little bit about the the Cornell study since that's uh, bas- basically right where we're broadcasting that's in from. Your neighborhood. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's probably the most interesting, uh, the most interesting psychic research that's ever been done, in my opinion, or at least the most interesting sort of laboratory experiments that's been that have ever been done. And those were done by uh, Daryl Bem, uh, Cornell, uh, very eminent, uh, very well respected uh, psychologist uh, who had you know done you know really really important, very good work in a number of fields in psychology. And in the, I guess it was the late eighties or early nineties, he sort of kind of by accident got, uh, involved in parapsychology. Not at that point, he was a skeptic, you know, he was a, he was not like a believer, but, uh, a colleague, uh, you know, was doing, uh, parapsychology research, um, uh, and wanted his, wanted his skills as a magician. He happens to, he happens to be a, 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 a trained mentalist, hmm. um, and wanted his skills, uh, because it's, it's, it's a good thing to have a magician on your team when you're doing parapsychology research oh, yeah. to detect against fraud, you know, and trickery. And so, uh, he sort of recruited, uh, Daryl Bem to help him. And in the process, Daryl Bem, you know, he was game for that. And he, in the process of helping, you know, his colleague with this research, he realized, hey, there's something really to this. And he, uh, he, you know, said to his colleague that, hey, you know, if you can find some results here, I'll help you get them published, you know, because I, you know, he had a, a, a good name and, and, and uh, was able to do that. Well, so, he, so that's sort of what got him into the field. And then, uh, longer, uh, somewhere around 2000 or, or around in there, he started a series of, uh, a major series of, of studies where he, these were big studies where, he, you know, in each experiment, he would have like a hundred students, uh, doing these, these tasks. And, and each of these, uh, experiments were reversing the temporal sequence of, a basic paradigm in psychology. So for instance, one of the paradigms is priming. Um, priming tasks in psychological experiments are designed to detect unconscious uh, influence on your behavior, uh, unconscious biases, and, and, and also uh, sort of subliminal effects. So for instance, a typical priming task would have a person sit in front of a computer and uh, make some kind of, you know, and they'll be presented with a choice between two options on the screen and they, they're supposed to pick one choice. Well, in a priming task, before they make their choice, subliminally they'll be presented, you know, they'll be, something will flash subliminally on the screen, like over one of the two choices that will, that they won't consciously register, but they will bias their, potentially bias their choice, you know? And so these tests, you know, show, you know, the effect, effect of unconscious priming. Well, in 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 Daryl Bem's experiments, he uh, had them make a choice, but he would flash the subliminal prime afterwards. Okay, uh, right. and it, but nevertheless, it would have an effect on their choice. Uh, and the most famous, uh, his most famous uh, experiment, the one that sort of got him the most publicity, was he would have people choose between two curtains on a screen, one of which showed a picture. Okay. Uh, it, it's not like there was actually a picture there. This is just a computer screen thing. And it showed a, a, two curtains and, and, and the picture would be chosen at random after they made their choice. But uh, they tended to be correct more than chance would predict when the picture that would be revealed by their choice was erotic. <laughs> okay versus when it was just a neutral picture not n- something not arousing um so 
and again, yeah, they, I mean, he found these, 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 uh, what are sometimes called presentiment effects, um, uh, in these experiments. I mean, he got significant results in these very large experiments and he put his, uh, his, he made the, he deliberately made the experiments very simple and the, the statistical analysis very simple and basic so that people could replicate it. That, cause that's, that's part of the problem with, with psi research is, is getting people to replicate your results and making it easy for them to replicate it. Uh, and so he, he did that. And subsequently, you know, a, a ton of, uh, I think, I feel I, I forget the exact number. I think it's in the eighties uh, of replica successful replications of his findings. Um, uh, so uh, you know, a lot of a lot of independent researchers have gone on to replicate these findings, and not. Uh, and I'll also mention uh, Dean Radin, of course, is a is a, is a very eminent, uh, probably a, probably the the pioneer of this this kind of presentiment research that is to say studying the sort of unconscious the sort of unconscious manifestations of precognition uh in his experiments that he's begun in the 1990s you know he would test people's sort of galvanic skin response and other sort of physiological responses uh again um these responses are expected after like an, uh, an arousing stimulus like seeing a a, you know, an erotic picture on the screen or, mm -hmm. or whatever, but he would detect responses prior to, uh, as well as after, uh, these stimuli. So, um, his research is also, you know, pioneering in this field. Um, uh, Daryl Bem called, you know, he, he published the result of, of nine of these studies, uh, in a 2011 paper called feeling the future. And it was, very widely publicized and it, you know he was on the colbert report and mm -hmm. uh but it was really embarrassing for the field of psychology um psycho scientific psychologists just had a fit <laughs> and they you know they ridiculed this they got angry that it was published i mean it was published in one of the top journals i mean and the editors of the journal even published sort of their this kind of little editorial statement at the beginning is like we don't understand this this goes against our beliefs about causality but you know this is this has gone through peer review and we feel like it's our responsibility to publish it and they just so they did the right thing you know and yeah uh, um but the field was people were 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 really really angry i actually happened to be uh working for a a psych one of the big psychological societies actually at the time it wasn't the one that published this 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 article but 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 there was a uh, a big hubbub about it and and you know <laughs> they were considering writing a letter, letter protesting this I, you know, at that point i was not really not aware of this kind of research and i thought well what's the big deal you know it's like they had an interesting finding they should they should publish it but it it, it, it made people so mad yeah. Um, so yeah, I really got, you know, a taste there of, of, of the, the powerful emotions that, um, that this kind of thing arouses in people who just don't want to have to face the cognitive dissonance of, you know, something that just goes against their, you know, belief system and causality, yeah. you know, that our, our stand, you know, our, 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 our common sense understandings of causality you know they're a they're a belief system like anything else i mean they're very deeply ingrained and and there's good reason for it you know it's like most you know the, the world that we interact with on a daily basis seems to you know follow a, a, an order of cause and effect that's you know a then b then c you know it's like it's you know you can't blame people for reacting uh feeling threatened by something like daryl bem's findings but right. Uh, you also need to be willing to to uh, read the evidence and and consider it and and look at the vast body of evidence that's been accumulated since the beginnings of parapsychology for precisely these kinds of effects. Um, and, and the th and the thing is, debunkers and stuff will always be like, "Well, show us the evidence." But when they see the evidence, then they they throw a fit. They, they throw a fit, or they. You know they will find some reason to deny that 
it's valid evidence. But, but the funny thing is that the great thing, the thing I love about the whole Daryl Bem affair is that it sparked this deep soul searching in the, in the field of psychology. They thought, well, if this can get published and if this, you know, if these, if he can find, if he can get statistically significant results from what to them, what to them was an absurdity, then they thought, well, there must be something wrong with, with our methods and our statistic, you know, the, the statistical methods we're using. And so uh, there was a big uh, push to, to start replicating uh, findings uh, all across scientific psychology. And there was a, uh, uh, and it was a few years ago now, uh, a team, a very large team set about uh, trying to replicate, I think, I think it was like the hundred, like a hundred findings from the three top psychological science journals from a year, you know, and they basically set about trying to replicate all the, the studies and they could only replicate something like 36% <laughs> of, of these findings. So indeed, uh, indeed, you know, it revealed that, that a lot of what was getting published in the top journals in psychological science was, was, you know, maybe subpar science, right. but, you know, contrastively, uh, uh, Daryl Bem's research, uh, has replicated very well. Uh, and that's, and that's true across parapsychology. I mean that, you know, parapsychologists have, because they've been in such a marginal position, they've had to be really, uh, really careful about their research. And in fact, uh, I believe that a lot of the, uh, that there are a lot of, um, sort of methodological fail-safes that, uh, in, in psychological research that, are, that were actually sort of developed in parapsychology because, um, because of this need for, for caution, <laughs> you know, uh, when you're dealing with something as sort of potentially outrageous as, as uh, the results you get in psi experiments. So, um, so yeah, it had a lot of ironic effects and, and it still angers people. And, and of course, if you get online and Google Daryl Bem, you'll, you'll see a lot of, a lot of claims that, you know, that this is bogus or that it couldn't replicate and yeah. uh, whatnot. You'll see just a lot of, of, of vitriol. Um, but, um, unfortunately it's real. <laughs> I don't know if it's unfortunate. Well, no, yeah. Fortunate unfortunate, unfortunate for them. Unfortunate if, you know, if you're really that, uh, threatened by, <laughs> by things that, that go against, um, your beliefs, a, a Newtonian understanding of physics and causa causation, which really has not been adhered to in actual physics for a, for a century, <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like, uh, you know, in physics, physicists don't really have a, <laughs> such a problem with, with the idea of, of causation going backwards. That's, that's not a new idea at all in physics. And, uh, but you know, the rest of the world has not gotten that memo. And, uh, this, this is kind of what you, the idea of this, of things going both forwards and backwards is kind of the uh, concept behind this book of, uh, time loops. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's, and I think this is something that, that people are going to have a little bit of a hard time wrapping their brain around. Um, I, I like the Jung example a lot. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's scarab. a wonderful, that's a wonderful example. And I, I love, I loved researching that chapter. Actually, I spent a lot of time research. I went really down the rabbit hole on Jung. In fact, I wound, I, I originally in the original draft, had a lot more <laughs> Jung stuff in it just because, um, well, he was so interesting and, and his world was so interesting. Um, but I had to sort of pare it down to the essentials. But the, the, the scarab example is one, part of the reason I like it is, is it's an example that we've all heard right. at some point because it's, you know, it's one of the most retold stories in metaphysical literature. And, you know, it's hard to, open, you know, you certainly can't open a book about coincidence or synchronicity without, you know, the scarab story. But it's, it's a story that finds its way into so much metaphysical and new age writing, you know, that it's like everybody has seen that story for, you know, just to, to refresh your memory. Um, you know, uh, this is, uh, we now know this happened probably in the year 1920. Um, but, uh, Jung was seeing a, a young woman 
patient uh, in his office who, you know, she, this patient was very, very hyper rational, very, um, kind of closed off. He thought to, to the irrational, to the unconscious, you know, uh, and he wasn't making much headway, uh, in her therapy. And so she comes into his office and brings and tells him about this dream that she'd had the night before. And this dream, uh, someone gave her a piece of of gold, precious golden jewelry in the form of a an Egyptian scarab beetle. Okay, well, right at that moment, he says, you know, he heard a tapping on the on the window behind him, and he he turns around, and there's this beetle on um, at the glass, and it's sort of like it's almost like it's trying to get into his office. And the beetle was a, it was a color rose chafer. It's sort of the, the central, you know, European, you know, relative of the scarab beetle. It sort of looks the same, but it's got kind of a greenish uh, iridescent shell. And so he opens the window and, and cups the beetle in his hand and hands it to his patient and said, here's your scarab. And okay, so, so this becomes his like, his famous, most famous case of what he would later call synchronicity. Now he, he didn't come up with that term immediately. It took him, uh, you know, a couple decades to come up with that concept. Um, and then he first wrote about it, uh, in a couple, in a, in a monograph and a lecture, uh, in like 1950 and 1951, I think. Um, and that's where he told this story. And at that, and at the time, and we've for decades we've only known basically what he told in that one paragraph where he writes about this this episode. Um, and fortunately, a few years ago, uh, a Jungian uh, analyst and curator at the Jung uh, Jung Center in Zurich uh, published a paper revealing the identity of the woman. And also revealing a lot of details about her biography and also telling where else she appears in Jung's writings. Uh, so, wow, this like opens up, you know, the possibility to really delve into this case. Um, and yeah, like I, it's, it's, it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating case to look at. I mean, first of all, it turns out that uh, uh, this, this woman was having precognitive dreams a lot. Now that's that's the that's the interesting thing about this the the scarab incident though is that people don't generally notice because they're sort of beguiled by Jung's concept of synchronicity, you know, and the coincidence of her telling him her dream about a scarab at the same moment that a scarab shows up at his window. He sort of sees it all as this simultaneity, this kind of this simultaneous thing, this co literally a coincidence happening involving him, sort of centered on him, in fact, in his office that day. But that sort of distracts people from seeing that that this was actually a case of a precognitive dream. This woman dreamed the night before about being handed a scarab, mm -hmm. you know, in the form of a piece of jewelry, and and then it happened in her life in that consulting room that day. So it's a precognitive dream, you know, and and you know, history is full of precognitive dreams like that. It's a very typical standard kind of precognitive dream. Uh, but his Jung's concept of synchronicity kind of distracts away from that. And uh, in fact, the very word synchronicity sort of implies things all happening together, sort of collapses the time dimension, you know? And what I'm arguing is that no, that time dimension is, is, is crucial. And that's what really makes uh, what makes this case interesting and what really kind of undercuts that theory of synchronicity. Because for, for Jung, synchronicity is reflected the kind of the work of, of archetypes of the collective unconscious sort of coming in and stage managing our lives to edify us or to, you know, bring us to new realizations, you know, because the, you know, he, his explanation was that, well, the, the scarab beetle was a symbol of rebirth and, you know, her, this woman's experience in his consulting room was to be opened to the mysteries and to the unconscious. Uh, and thus she, you know, metaphorically, she was sort of reborn, you know, in his consulting room. Uh, well, I argue a lot. Th th there's there's a good case to be made that 
the archetypes of the collective unconscious are really just the books on Jung's bookshelf. Um, <laughs> and he was sort of eliciting this stuff from his patients and he was rewarding them when they brought, you know, archetypal material into their, in their dreams, into his consulting room and so on. Um, and, uh, so, you know, really the, the, what's pri you know, what's, what's fundamental here is the woman had a precognitive dream and it happened to be about, uh, an archetype who happened to be about this, this thing that for Jung, you know, was archetypal, but there was archetypal, but, but he went ahead and explained it to her. He went ahead and explained the archetypal meaning to her, you know, during the session. So she was, you know, precognizing this, this very important, significant, uh, moment in her therapy. Uh, and, and that's, you know, why this particular episode seems archetypal. You know, most precognitive experiences aren't archetypal unless they happen in a Jungian context, <laughs> you know, right. uh, precognitive experiences happening in a Freudian context, for instance, uh, are, are Oedipal, you know, there, there's, you know, uh, the, the sort of the, the orientation of your therapist is going to determine <laughs> the kind of, of dreams you have and the kind of, um, precognitive experiences that you have. But yeah. it's a fascinating case, partly because what we now know is that she, the same woman, that her name was, uh, was uh, Maggie Quarles Van Ufford. Uh, she was a, an aristocratic, a young aristocratic woman from Holland. And uh, she had uh, other precognitive dreams in, his, uh, in her therapy with, uh, with Jung. Uh, and so I, in the chapter on her, I, I go into some of her other precognitive experiences, too. It's a fascinating case. Yeah. And so basically what you're saying is that because she was going to be handed the scarab the next day from from Jung, she had a precognitive dream about it, which then led her to be talking about the dream while she was handed the scarab. So, so hence exactly. the loop. That's exactly it. And that's a, a, that actually is a feature of many precognitive experiences. And it's one of the things that drives people to seek some other explanation because mm -hmm. they don't grasp that that prophecy can be self-fulfilling that the fact that it's uh, there's a self-fulfilling or a looping aspect to it i mean it's like she you know she had this experience he only gave her the scarab because she was telling him about her dream so the right. dream caused the event but the event you know you know arguably refluxed in her mind in her brain and gave her a dream the night before. So it is a time, it is a looping phenomenon. It's a literally a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's, uh, and that's the argument I'm making in the book is that all prophecy, all precognition is self-fulfilling that, uh, that, uh, you know, our actions in one way or another, usually unconsciously uh, will serve to, you know, bring about the, the episode or the, uh, experience that is precognized. So that's, that's the, the, that's one of the hardest things to grasp about this topic. And that's, you know, one of the reasons it's difficult. And then one of the reasons, uh, you know, the, the book is so long is, yes, is it really, yeah. you know, it takes a lot of, you know, you, you really have to sort of see it in a lot of different manifestations and a lot of different uh, settings to sort of get that, that looping quality uh, to to precognition, um, but it's uh, it, but it makes a, a uh, I think a very parsimonious and elegant explanation for an experience that we all have you know a lot, which is synchronicity. You know what we call synchronicity um, that you know that is the meaningful coincidence um, when when people when when people are precognitively oriented toward rewards or towards significant experiences in their near future, and they don't realize that fact because none of us realize that we're precognitive, uh, we will then have these experiences which feel like the universe is somehow stage managing events in our lives. It will feel like um, 
you know, God or, or some higher intelligence is steering us or that we've kind of been expected. It's almost a feeling like, you know, like you feel like you're crashing a party, but then you find that you're on the guest list, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's that weird feeling, you know, the, and the term synchronicity is really good for, for just sort of as a label for these kinds of experiences. Um, uh, they're going to be a nat they're going to be a, a, a ordinary part of life for beings like ourselves who are actually precognitive and don't know it. And w one of the things that this, that <laughs> happens a lot to me, um, one of the only channeled works I, I have any any faith whatsoever in is the Jane Roberts Seth material. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. be because regardless of what it was, there's, there's wisdom in there. And one of the things that Seth always said is you affect the past as well as the future. Mm -hmm. And so he, he can, although he used a multi-world interpretation of things, um, he was also saying that you do, you know, this type of thing happens. Yeah. And that's yeah. exactly what this brought to mind was that, that him talking mm. about stuff like that. That's uh, great. Yeah. The, um, Oh, what was the thing? You you were also talking about how uh, things like this might be a lower instinct rather than a higher instinct. We always think of uh, something like precognition as being something that uh, is is a higher ability. You know, as we get you know as our consciousness raises, we get to to do stuff like this. But you're suggesting that it's also a survival thing, and that even simple life forms might have. Uh, some level of precognition, so it might actually be a lower instinct that we've just learned to ignore because it doesn't fit with our form of how reality is. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think that uh, that this is a basic function of not just of of creatures with nervous systems, but uh, potentially of life itself. Um, I, I, I sort of, I, I broached this topic a little bit in chapter seven of the book. I don't go into a lot of detail just because it's sort of, it's a little tangential, but I think that, that, that retro causation, which is sort of the principle on which precognition is based. I just, my money is that it's going to turn out to be sort of the basis of, of life. Like what distinguishes living systems from you know, lifeless matter and that, and that, that, uh, you know, the first, you know, the, the simplest cell, you know, single celled organisms are going to turn out to be, uh, sort of governed by, uh, quantum retro causation effects. You know, the field of quantum biology is really in its infancy. It's just, I mean, literally it's, it's, a little over a decade old right now. Um, uh, so, so right now researchers have just scratched the surface of quantum effects in living systems, but it's turning out to be uh, really basic to some of them, like, like photosynthesis. I mean, that's, that's huge. You know, it's one of the, you know, the, it's the basis of the, of some of the first life on earth, uh, works by qu what this effect called quantum tunneling. Um, well, if, if, uh, as some quantum physicists argue, if these these spooky quantum effects are really retro causation effects, uh, then retro causation is going to be sort of the explanation for what uh, what biologists and philosophers have sort of sought for two centuries, which is sort of an explanation of how you can get something like life in a thermodynamic universe uh, because you know if the universe is as was argued in by the enlightenment you know scientists you know newton and so on you know if it's if it's always you know losing losing order uh then life just makes no sense you know how could life arise you know in an entropic uh universe and so in the 19th century you had ideas like vitalism. Uh, in the 20th century, there have been, there have been various ideas proposed. Uh, syntropy is one of them. Uh, and of course, uh, Rupert Sheldrake's uh, formative causation uh, is another one. Um, anyway, sort of attempts to come up with some new principle that would somehow explain uh, how you know living systems could arise, now they can function. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I think 
quantum retrocausation is going to be the answer to that. And uh, it'll be the answer, uh, you know, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to explain, you know, a lot of processes happening in cells, not, and not just neurons. Neurons scale it up, you know, nervous systems scale it up uh, enormously uh, and enable, you know, the kinds of phenomena we call, you know, precognition. But uh, I think, I think even cells are going to turn out to be, you know, I don't know what the word would be, presentimental or, or something. I mean, it's, they're, they're going to be sort of oriented towards, uh, towards survival in their future. Okay. Um, so, how does our our concept of time affect this? Like, does it prevent us from seeing these these uh, precognitive sort of abilities? Like, if we had a like, you you bring up the movie uh, The Arrival, right? Uh, and how changing their concept of time and the way they think about things allowed her to uh, see different periods of time in her life and actually get answers in the future. Um, do you think that that's something that our culture has just been so set in a past to future methodology that if we started to accept that sometimes things come backwards as well as forwards, it would change our entire outlook on things? That's a good question. I don't know. I, I, I've thought a lot about it. Uh, and I think to some degree, yes, I think, I think, I think sort of getting rid of the cult, part of the, the, Part of what prevents us from seeing and understanding and accepting uh, the existence of something like precognition uh, is kind of cultural beliefs and layers of of what I sometimes call causal bias, you know, and and um, kind of these these beliefs about causation and that are, we've sort of inherited from three centuries of of enlightenment science and Newtonian thinking and so forth. Um, and, and certainly there are also linguistic, uh, things, you know, the, our language doesn't like, you know, things that, that don't have a causal order to them or that are circular in cause, you know, it's like, it's very hard, uh, to describe, you know, these kinds of causal loops and time loops that I'm describing in the book. You know, it's like you, you, how do you describe, uh, these, these, causal things that run in circles it's just it doesn't it sort of defies certainly our language and i don't uh, i don't know if there are other languages on earth <laughs> that are that are more that are better at expressing sort of circular causal relationships there probably are um and it's an open question whether those you know those cultures are you know better at consciously embracing their precognitive natures i that's a great open question for some other anthropologists to deal with i i don't <laughs> i don't i don't have the answer i don't think that's all of it though i think uh i do suspect there's some deep you know biological reason why it's so hard to think about this stuff and it probably has to do with um uh you know it probably gets to questions of consciousness itself which i am you know i'm not making an attempt to answer the question of consciousness and what consciousness is in this book um uh but you know there's there's some reason why um our consciousness seems to move in a single direction through the dimension of time uh, and, and that, you know, that may, I don't know what the reason is. And that's, you know, that's a big question. And, you know, lots of people have been trying to answer that question for a long, long time. And, uh, I don't think we're going to get an answer to that anytime soon. So that's, that's yeah. a mystery. Um, so I don't think, no, I don't think that a scenario like an arrival is going to happen where we're going to suddenly wake up to our you know, and have explicit precognitive visions of our future and then live to fulfill them. I, I don't, precognition is not going to work like that. It's not going to be as, as explicit as that is. Uh, I, I think that it is, however, possible to sort of throw off some of the sh cognitive shackles, I guess, uh, that prevent us from at least accepting the existence of this kind of thing and enable us to learn to notice it better in our own lives and uh and maybe make use of it 
in a better way. I do think that's possible, but it, but it'll never, you're never going to have, uh, let me put it this way. And I think this is how I put it in the book. You're never going to have, for instance, a, a vivid, accurate precognitive dream of an event that you could act to prevent. You know, you're never going to have, uh, you know, it's always going to be, your precognition is always going to be oblique and, and, and symbolic or not, you know, it's going to be, you know, it's going to suggest things, but it's not going to be direct because in a world where we have free will or think we exert free will, um, uh, you, uh, events, you can't have a pre, uh, a, a premonition of an event that you could then act to, com- you know, completely, foreclose in your future because then the event wouldn't happen and you wouldn't have the dream in the first place. So there's kind of a, a circular logic to it that, that, that makes precognition be about events that are going to happen. Uh, now they can, you can, and this is very common in the literature on precognition. You can have some sort of premonition of an event that you avoid personally. So for instance, you know, a, a plane crash or, you know, people had precognitive dreams about the Titanic sinking and some of them, some people avoided taking, you know, riding on the Titanic and right. save their lives. You know, the Titanic still sank and they, you know, but what they were precognizing was not themselves dying on the Titanic. They were precognizing reading the news of the Titanic sinking. And that's another, you know, key point um, to the book is that precognition is not of events per se. It's of our own learning of events. It's our own uh, learning experiences in our future. And the yeah. thoughts the thoughts and feelings that we have in response to powerful learning experiences in our future. That's what we're precognizing. Um, yeah, and that, 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 that's really interesting because when, when, when I read that and started thinking about it, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. It's not some, someone doesn't dream about the Titanic sinking. They dream about seeing the article where the Titanic sinks. And you give exactly. some examples in there where people had information wrong because they read it wrong in the article. Exactly. Uh, exactly. This is, this is one of the things uh, that makes it possible to study and actually kind of verify the existence of precognition from anecdotal reports. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very, you know, ordinarily if, if, if the news is exactly accurate, then it's hard to tell whether you're precognizing the news or precognizing the event or, and so on. But um, I'll mention uh, J.W. Dunn was a, an aeronautical engineer in the early years of the last century who noticed he was having precognitive dreams. And they were off, often of precognitive dreams of things, you know, striking news stories, for instance. Um, but he was able to tell that he was dreaming of the news, of reading the news report and not of the actual event, because often there's a discrepancy between what the news reports and what, and what is actually happening. Uh, so, for instance, his most famous example was the eruption of Montpellier uh, on the island of Martinique in, um, in, uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, and this was in, I think, 1900, maybe, or 1902. Uh, he, you know, he's camped out with his regiment in South Africa. He's fighting in the Boer War. And uh, the new, the, he has a dream, a very vivid dream, where he's on a volcano that's about to erupt. And, and in the dream, you know, 4,000 people are about to, to die in this, in this eruption. He's trying to get the French authorities to, to, to listen to him because 4,000 people are about to die. Uh, well, uh, the next day or a couple of days later, the, the mail, a bundle of mail arrives in the camp and there's a newspaper and he reads, you know, the front page of the newspaper is that Montpellier, you know, erupts, killing 40,000 people. And so it's like, you know, it's exactly like in his dream. He, in fact, he even misread the, the, the headline to be 4,000, not 40,000. I mean, it's easy to sort of, you know, skip a zero in, in big numbers mm-hmm. like that. Um, but the interesting thing is the actual death toll turned out to be something like 36,000. It was like, no, there was no four in it. You know, it was not, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't dreaming of the actual eruption. You know, he was dreaming of 
you know, he, he was dreaming of a scene that he would imagine upon reading that news article. Um, and, and, and as I argue, as I show in the book, he was actually, uh, dreaming of some of his own thoughts that he was going to have upon reading that news article, having dreamed of it in the past, but I won't go into the, the, the sort of the, <laughs> the wrinkles of that. It's a very uh, kind of convoluted, but, uh, I think there are some interesting. You can you can psychoanalyze these precognitive dreams often, and and really uh, dig up some really interesting interesting quirks about precognition. But um, at at the same time, though, if you had okay, so let's say you have a precognitive dream, but you don't know it's a precognitive dream because you change things and it never comes to pass. Then it wouldn't be something you would be looking at in like in this research because it wasn't precognitive because it had been changed. Well, that's presuming that you can. That's presuming a future. That's presuming that you can right. change the future. Right. Yeah, and of course, there you're sort of beyond the scope of testability. <laughs> you know, it's like you can com- claim that every dream is precognitive of a future that doesn't happen. But then, you know, when you have a a, a precognitive dream of you know very precise kind of dream of an experience you know years or decades in the future uh it it sort of goes against to my mind that idea of you know multiple timelines and and so forth that that you know the sort of the butterfly effect idea that that you know things can take a million different paths uh based on our actions um right. Uh, yeah, these are, I mean, these are deep questions and obviously I, I, you know, I'm not, this isn't going to be the last word on, on this. I'm sure a lot of people, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people will, will, will want to, uh, uh, um, uh, argue against this book. So I'm hoping this provokes some debate. I, you know, reading, reading the book, I think you're, you're definitely onto something with these time loops. I, I can pick out different experiences in my life where that definitely seems like it very well could have been the case. Um, but I also wonder if there are certain events, uh, I guess this is always the way I've looked at things. Like there are certain events that are going to happen. Um, for whatever reason, they're, they're sort of predestined events. And even if you don't take the path of least resistance there, it's going to take you there one way or another. So when you're having a, a precognitive dream, like you talk about at the end, which was what, 12 years ago, it was 18 years, yeah. 18 years ago. So it might be that this was something that was going to happen no matter what path you took. And then then again, if you hadn't taken this path, you would never have looked at that dream again. Right. You know, so it's it's like, un, un, unfortunately, we can't, we can't play what if and, right. and go down different paths and see what would happen. Right. And I, and I always, well, talking about like free will and stuff, I always think that, you know, like I'll be driving down the road and I'll be like, could I just turn my car and drive into that tree? I mean, I wouldn't, mm-hmm. and I know I won't, but mm-hmm. could I, mm-hmm. you know, is, is it within the realm of possibility for me to do that? And a lot of people will mm-hmm. say, well, sure. And I'm like, but I don't know. Cause I wouldn't do it. Right. Well, you know, th- that's the, that's the thing. It's like, we feel, we, we go through life feeling as though we have free will. I mean, our feeling of free will is certainly part of our experience, but in hindsight, we did what we did. And, and that feeling of free will is a memory, but it's, it's fixed in a, in a sort of fixed past. Now, you know, the, ever since Einstein, uh, pretty much physicists have, have kind of been forced to accept the idea that we live in what is sometimes called a block universe. And I talk about this a lot in the book, uh, the idea that, that, uh, that past, present and future are all part of this big four-dimensional block, and and you know because you know if you if given Einstein's discoveries, um, you know something, an event that's you know happening in one person's present that may feel like free will, all that it's in somebody else's past already, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so from another observer's point of view, so so really everything you know we're doing is in somebody's past in which case it's fixed you know it's 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 uh you know so it may feel very you know we we may feel experience our lives um as though it's completely open-ended as though the future is open-ended 
Um, but uh, in a relativistic universe, that's really not, you know, that's not really the way things are fundamentally. That you know, there's there's kind of a fixity to it. Now that that's one of the ideas. That's one of the aspects of of precognition and uh, related concepts like time travel that that kind of put people off the whole topic because we're very you know we we you know our ours is a very individual individualistic freedom loving society. We love the idea that we're masters of our destiny and so forth. We don't like the idea of fate uh, is a very it's a very, um, it's kind of ancient notion that we're, we feel very comfortable not uh, giving ourselves over to this, you know, ancient idea of fate as being, as sort of dictating our lives. But um, I, I sort of invite people, my book is in some ways an invitation to people to, to just sit with the idea of a block universe for a while and see if it doesn't start to grow on you. I mean, it, my, my initial re knee-jerk reaction was the same as most people. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, I can't accept, you know, eternalism is the word sometimes used um, for this. And in fact, in even some of my blog posts a few years, you know, a few years ago, I was sort of, I kind of rejected it because I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around, uh, I, I just couldn't somehow give up my sort of knee-jerk defense of the idea of free will. But uh, the more you kind of study this and think about it, um, the more, believe it or not, the more appealing <laughs> the kind of block universe idea becomes. And I'll say, I don't really go talk about this in the, in the book, although I do talk about it a lot on my blog. Uh, I, I am a sort of on again, off again, uh, practitioner of Zen and, uh, it actually fits you know, very, very well with a Zen kind of spirituality or a Zen worldview. Um, and it's actually in a, in a, a kind of Zen sort of altered frame of mind. It's actually, uh, an incredibly blissful <laughs> idea. It's not, it's not this imprisoning negative, uh, idea at all, but you kind of have to be in an altered <laughs> frame of mind <laughs> to, to kind of get that, get the appeal of it, but uh, I, I find that that it's actually a very spiritually validating and fulfilling idea. Uh, well, it's, it's it's more an actor in a play sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is, and you know, any number of spiritual you know gurus or whatever in various traditions will will counsel you to to adopt that spectator role you know, uh, about your own life, you know, just kind of step back and let yourself live and don't get hung up on your actions and, and, uh, whether you have free will or not, you know, that's a, that's a big, that's a lot of baggage, you know, just, just step back. You're going to act anyway. You're going to do mm -hmm. things, but you'll find what you will find is that when you sort of you know, drop that baggage of, of how should I act? What am I doing the right thing? You suddenly find that your actions are much more skillful and effective <laughs> and you're happier. And, you know, like, and you suddenly set back and you watch yourself being really witty and brilliant and, and skillful and doing the right thing is like that sort of Zen, you know, being in the, in the, in the groove and, and, and just being this, you know, really spontaneous, successful, witty, you know, funny person. <laughs> you know, so it's like it's it's actually a really good uh, exercise just to pretend that you don't have free will and just sit back and watch yourself be and watch yourself act, you know. And uh, so no, I, so it, so the kind of the block universe that goes along with uh, a kind of spiritual, uh, I guess, practice for me, which is sort of harmonizes very well. I've found. Um, and that's one of the kind of actual uh, benefits or the, 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 I think the strongest uh, benefit of the practice of like recording dreams and, and sort of ex exploring your own precognition in the form of dreams and synchronicities and things like that is kind of getting a, getting a sort of reinforcing that, that feeling of, of this, this larger blocky universe. 
And the, the, the other option is that we do live in a multiverse, um, and that, that things could still come back and we could still have free choice at the same time because it'd be multiple futures to, to pick from. But one of the, the ways that that sprung up is from the some of the things that have come up in quantum physics and such, which you have shown in the book could possibly be explained by retrocausation. That's right. Um, the, the multiverse uh, and the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics is one of the ways of, of kind of saving uh, consistency in a quantum universe, but the alternative is retrocausation. Retrocausation kind of uh, is antithetical in a way to the the many worlds interpretation. And um, and again, like I said, my money is on the retrocausation paradigm ultimately winning out. Uh, uh, already, a lot of you know a lot of a lot of people have problems with the many worlds view. It 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 feels. Um, it, on the one hand, you know, it makes for some nice science fiction stories and it's kind of fun to think about, but it also feels like cheating (laughs) in a way. Um, and, uh, the retro causation paradigm, it's kind of harder to wrap your head around, but Mm -hmm. it actually makes better sense or more or kind of a simpler sense of a lot of quantum spooky quantum phenomena uh so yeah, my money is that you know in 20 years people are not going to be talking about multiverse uh or at least they're not going to be talking about the many worlds interpretation uh as much as they're going to be talking about retro causation uh at least that's that's my bet but yeah, it's you know that's one person's opinion. But <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 a good theory. It really is. It's it's neat and it uh it does it it fits. Um, one of the things you talk about, like with uh with dream prophecy and stuff with uh, premonitions and dreams, is that it's usually of traumatic events. Well, okay, trauma. It's not. It's of traumatic events in this very broad psychoanalytic sense of the term. Uh, trauma really can can be big trauma, like you know, death and disaster and so forth. But it can also be mild, minor trauma. You know, the, the sink backing up. That's traumatic. <laughs> in a, <laughs> Fair in enough. A, in a in a in a slight way, or you know, slipping and falling on the ice is traumatic. Um, just, you know, a, a chaotic experience that embarrasses you is traumatic. Trauma can be big and it can be very small. And the, the sort of the, the fundamental sort of commonality to these big and small traumas is that you survive it. Um, the point is if you're traumatized, in even a, in a tiny way or even a big way, the point is you've survived, whatever it is. You know, it, it, by definition, to be traumatized is to have survived something, right? Um, so what precognition focuses on is those experiences of survival. And, but it's not necessarily, now are the famous cases, the, the most famous cases uh, in the literature on premonition and prophecy are often yeah the disasters the you know the plane crashes the titanic um uh you know a loved one's death you know these are the famous cases but i've certainly found in my own study of precognitive dreams i mean luckily my life you know knock on wood my life until now has been relatively trauma free in that sense but you know i i my precognitive dreams focus on things like the sink backing up or or you know, being embarrassed about some you know some embarrassment or some um, uh, you know my, minor traumas. Now that's not always the case. There are some just pure uh, rewards uh, that that precognition focuses on. But yeah, very often they have to do with some sort of chaotic, uh, so something chaotic, something threatening, something that upsetting. Uh, but that we also withstand. And so there's kind of a positive and a negative valence to them in that, in that you, uh, there's this kind of upsetting or embarrassing or painful thing that happened, but 
I'm okay. I'm still here, you know? And, right. uh, and that's, and that I think seems to be the kind of core emotional thread of precognitive experiences. And, you know, our lives are full of these things, you know, big, big and little, you know, mostly little, fortunately. Yeah. Um, but I, I think people who, who make a practice of really recording their dreams, uh, religiously in a, you know, in an electronic journal of some sort, um, find that, you know, they can identify, you know, as many as a quarter of their dreams being precognitive of these kinds of events happening in the next couple of days. And if that's the case, if they're, if they're identifying, you know, as many as a quarter of their dreams as precognitive, uh, you can bet that a lot more of them are precognitive of events at a greater remove. And it's just, it's just harder to identify, um, what the target, you know, experience of those events might be. But, um, I've, my working, you know, I don't say this in the book because, you know, this is not necessarily quite ready for prime time, but my, my working hypothesis at this point is that all dreams have precognitive content um, and that dreams that seem to be about the past are just using past events as kind of symbols to represent something coming down the pike in the future. But it's mm. very, it would be very, it would be impossible to prove that. Uh, it would be, uh, you know, it would it'd be very hard to prove that. Um, so, but it's very, it's very hard to prove anything about the tr content of dreams. It's, it's, it's just intrinsically hard to study dream content for a lot of reasons. But that's my kind of working hypothesis. And it's, it sort of guides my own investigation of, of my dreams these days. Now, one of the things you, you talk about here is that what, when we have these visions, these prophetic dreams and stuff, they're usually within our experience, our future experience. What about, um, and I don't necessarily put a lot of faith in this type of stuff, but what about someone like uh, Nostradamus who is believed to have seen future events long past his lifetime? Yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a great question. I, those cases like Nostradamus, I, I don't, I can't take those seriously because they're too old and we just don't know enough about the circumstances in which those prophecies were made, uh, how they've been transmitted to us, you know, mm -hmm. how much, you know, scribal error and <laughs> forgery. And there's, there's so many issues that can affect those ancient, those not ancient, but old cases like Nostradamus. And, and also, you know, the, the prophecies are so vague um, yeah. that it's just, it's, it's so easy to, to, to force fit, you know, event, modern events into, into those frameworks. That said, there are, there are cases uh, out there that seem to defy this model. Um, uh, you know, for instance, Okay, I'll name one case that that I find perplexing. Uh, it's a story by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, <clears throat> the title of the story is um, it is I'm blanking on it right now, but it's sort of <laughs> of course it's about but it it centers on uh, three men in a lifeboat, three or four men in a lifeboat who are forced to 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 who kill and eat one of the uh, one of the men they're with and like after long after his death, like a couple decades after his death, uh, there was a widely publicized case of, uh, cannibalism, in a, in a lifeboat and the men's names were identical to, Oh yeah. You yeah. Know, uh, so that's a, that's puzzling. I'm not, you know, again, I haven't, delved into the statistics of those names and, you know, th th there's all kinds of ways you can sort of, uh, you know, zoom in on a case and, and try and debunk it or whatever. I, I wouldn't want to try and debunk it, but, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's a story that seems to like, well, that's really, you know, how could that be? That's that happened after he was, he was dead. But honestly, there aren't a lot of cases like that, that, right. uh, that I have come across. Um, there are, there are a few, but 
they're, you know, they're, they're so few that I, I, you know, it's certainly something that I continue to look into and I'm not ignoring, but, uh, there, there are not enough that, that convince me. Well, I also wonder if, if, if we do have like past and future lives, if occasionally we remember stuff from those. Well, that's, you know, certainly some people would, uh, would, would argue that, you know, I, I, it's, uh, yeah, and I can't, I sir, I can't speak to that. Um, uh, my, my, here's where I, I sort of, you know, I don't like to call myself a materialist because, you know, materialist materialism has such a bad, <laughs> gets such a bad rap right now, <laughs> especially in the, in the paranormal world, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah. if you're a materialist, you're a bad guy. Uh, but I am, you know, I, I do, you know, I'm basically sympathetic to the materialist you know, view in the sense, the, the broad, a broad minded materialism that, that accepts that, you know, well, you know, the material world is much more nuanced and interesting than, than many, uh, many people have given it credit. And, and, and we're, the sciences are due for a major paradigm overhaul, uh, <clears throat> here and, and retro causation is going to be a big part of it. And it's going to, you know, just blow th- I mean it's just gonna blow things wide open for for understanding of all kinds of phenomena that have not had any home in science for a long time um, but uh, but you know but but that said I, I am basically sympathetic the idea that that this is precognition could be a just a, a purely brain based phenomenon and that and that the brain there's you know I, I can envision a way that that uh, the brain could communicate with itself across time. Like uh, I use the analogy of a tesseract, uh, from science fiction. Uh, you know, this kind of a portal through time. I you know, argue that that's basically what the brain is. It's a portal, an information portal through time. Um, in that, you know, in that case, well, when the brain is gone, you know, what's left, you know, that's, so I don't know. I mean, you, you, reincarnation, sure. It's a possibility. And then that's, um, uh, certainly, you know, it's a possibility. I'm, it's sort of <laughs> beyond the scope of what I'm, I'm comfortable arguing about or, or yeah, talking about, fine. Book. but yeah, it was, it was just it's something that had occurred to me, you know? Um, sure. No, I mean, I've, I get that question a lot, actually. <laughs> it's like, oh. well, what about future lives? It's like, okay, yeah, that's, it's, it's certainly a possibility. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the only thing about reincarnation that, that gives me pause is when kids can remember details about past lives without hypnosis or anything else. That's, that's really the only thing where I stop and go, okay, that's interesting. You know, <laughs> um, uh, my co-host Red Pill wanted me to ask you uh, on Radio Mysterioso. Apparently, you said materialism isn't going anywhere. Right. Yeah. Well, that's. Yeah. I mean, it's like material. Yeah. It, it's uh, there's. You'll see the, I you know the the sentiment expressed quite often in the paranormal world that materialism is dead, uh, or whatever. Well, that's just, that's just not, that ain't the case. Uh, and I, you know, sitting as I do, you know, my day job is as a science writer, I work for a, you know, big neuroscience institute. He's like, it's, you know, materialism isn't going anywhere. Materialism is, is, is alive and, and well, and it's, uh, you know, our lives are all made possible <laughs> by, by centuries of, of, you know, very materialist science and technology. Oh, yeah. um, so, you know, there's, it's not about to evaporate or go away, you know, because of a few um, anomalies uh, that have, uh, you know, that are, that persist, you know, on, on the margins of current paradigms. Um, but like I said, I mean, you can, you can, we're due for some major paradigm shifts here. And, you know, for instance, quantum physics is not an, a non-material theory. It's a theory of, of, of matter. It just, you know, it says that matter is not, you know, you know, stuff, it's something else, but it's right. still, a, it's still a theory of physics of, you know, physics, you know, being, you know, matter and energy, basically, you know, whatever that means. Um, so, you know, you know, materialism 
you know, is here to stay. What would be nice is, is a, a much broader vision uh, of the natural world uh, that, that was not, that, 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 that incorporated, found a way to incorporate uh, all the anomalies that we are, uh, that you and I are interested in, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not only, you know, psychic phenomena, but, you know, UFOs and all the other uh, things that certain that currently not only don't have a home within, you know, mainstream sciences, but that are, you know, unfairly ridiculed and, uh, and rejected, uh, just because of kind of closed mindedness and because of institutional, you know, pressures to conform, you know, there's just so much mm -hmm. conformity and so forth. I mean, that's the real problem. I mean, the problem as I see it is not, okay, materialism is due for an overhaul and the, the institutions of science, uh, need to, uh, the cultures need to kind of, uh, cure themselves of some cert of certain ills. Uh, and also, science needs to realize that it needs the humanities, that it needs, um, you know, other epistemologies that aren't scientific. There are some things that you simply can't study scientifically, right. and uh, and you need other approaches and methodologies, and you need to, you know, ra talk across disciplines rationally, um, uh, and that. So, you know, there, there are a lot of problems with science right now, but the, but, you know, mater, like I said, yeah, materialism isn't going away. Okay. All right. I actually read that, that wrong. And that's like, I read what he wrote, but I didn't realize that's what you meant by it. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think, I think there needs to be like any of this stuff is, um, it's all connected. I mean, it's not two mm -hmm. separate things. You can't, even though that's the problem with the term the paranormal is that it's easy for people to kind of cut it away from yeah. science and everything else. Yeah. It's just things we don't understand. We don't know how to interpret. Yeah, exactly. I know that's the, this is, yeah, I, I, I don't really like the term paranormal. I know I'm, um, I don't know. It's, it's a good term in some ways, but it's, yeah, people tend, to, people who are not, uh, who don't study the paranormal tend to sort of, I think, lump it with the supernatural or, mm -hmm. you know, or the occult or whatever. They, they, they sort of see it as, um, as superstition and, right. and something that doesn't belong in the, in the realm of nature. And, and that's not at all what you and I mean by it, but, um, but yeah, finding the right, <laughs> finding the right term is hard. Um, I mean, it's it, yeah. it, even even supernatural. It's the same thing. Everything's natural. It's just that we don't understand exactly. how it works yet. Right. Right. And eventually, some you know, and it might be that science needs to change its its parameters a little bit. That not everything can be broken down the way it wants to break everything down. You might have to look at it more holistically in in, yeah. in different ways. Yeah. Right. Right. So. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, we're going to do a Patreon segment. Uh, I have a couple other questions, and we're almost out of time. Um, I highly recommend people check this book out. It is an excellent book. It's a long book. You you do right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's called Time Loops, Precognition, Retrocausation, and the Unconscious. Uh, you are Eric Wargo, and your blog is where? Is the nightshirt, uh, uh, and it can be found at the nightshirt, all one word, dot com. Uh, and I write a lot more extensively about these topics on on there. And why the name the nightshirt? It's from a dream. <laughs> oh, okay. I, uh, I had a long time ago, but uh, yeah, I don't. In fact, that's a that's a good question. I, I named my blog that long before I started before I knew I was going to be writing about dreams or, huh. or the paranormal, but it, it has a good kind of uh, mysterious <laughs> uh, quality to it. Uh, so, yeah, no, it's a good name. I was just wondering what it, what it was from. Yeah. All right. Well, I thank you for spending some time with us. We're going to do a Patreon segment, as I said, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Soraya. This has been great. And a special thanks to all my patrons who helped make this podcast possible 
And a special shout out to those pledging $10 or more. Tim. An extra special thanks to Tim. Allison Cook. Super Inframan. Andy McNamara. Bart Ooms. Charles Beauregard. Craig Cicernos. Eric Citron. Jose A. Kevin. Scott Morris Everett. Sean Cosgrove. Robert Groom. Roland Belstat. Mike McGuire. Riker and Stark, John Rutledge Foster III, Sasha Org, Christopher Vaughn, Samantha, Ben Crow, American Rambler, Carla Mahoney, John Eddy, Chris, Mark Brady, William Lovelace, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Kevin Schreck, Paul Buscini, and Alfred Tuttle. Thank you all so very much. All right, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Continued for another uh, 20 minutes or so with Eric in a Patreon-only segment. And uh, if you want to become a patron, go to wheredtheroadgo.com and click on the Patreon link. We're still collecting stories, uh, and already have a bunch of them, but we're still collecting stories for future listener experience shows. So if you've had an experience, a weird experience, or a weird story you want to share, email us at stories at wheredtheroadgo.com. That stories at wheredtheroadgo.com. And if you go to wheredtheroadgo.com, there's a link for that as well. Next week is the sixth anniversary of Where Did the Road Go? I started it on January 26th, uh, 2013. And my first guest was Jim Elvich, talking about his book, The Universe Solved. Um, at the time, I wasn't even sure if I was going to do guests or roundtables or what. It was kind of an open question. And uh, I had heard Jim on uh, Coast to Coast and was really fascinated by his work. Plus, he was a Cornell grad, and he actually knew the radio station, WVBR, that we broadcast initially on uh, before it goes to podcast and such. So uh, he was my first guest. He was, uh, I think, my guest last year for the anniversary, along with Greg Bishop. But this week, or this year... Jim Elvich has a new book. Words are hard sometimes. And it's called Digital Consciousness. And uh, we're going to be talking about that next week for the sixth anniversary of Where Did the Road Go? And, uh, yeah, I can't believe it's already been six years. This has been a great trip. And thank you all for your support. Uh, Patreon or not, people who spread the word, people who contact me, it's uh, been way more than I ever expected. So thank you. See you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>